first speaker this morning is going to share how we can look beyond ourselves and engage the world, to engage mission. He's the Director of Evangelization for the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception and Director of Formation for the Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy. He is the best-selling author and lives and works at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. Brothers and sisters, please help welcome to SLS 20, Father Michael Gately. Thank you. Let's see, do I drink or do I? Hold on. Thank you. Um, why don't we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. <laughs> oh, wow, nice crowd. <laughs> I just wish that these conferences could be at another time of the year. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, it's great to be in Phoenix in winter, especially when you live in New England like I do. <laughs> wow. It was great to have the big party to bring in New Year's with thousands of college students. But you don't celebrate for that? Oh, okay. It was great to be here. Actually, I'm just kidding. I flew in on Wednesday, so you guys wouldn't wake me up. <laughs> I'm getting old <laughs> compared to you guys. Um, but really, this conference, I wish it was held at another time of the year, and I say that because every year uh, in December, so around this time, I take a month off and I go to my writing cave at my parents' house in California and just basically, <laughs> I basically spend a month uh, trying to write a book. And so that's, that's good. But the thing that's not so good, the problem is that I hardly talk. So for a month when you don't talk, you kind of forget how to speak. Try it sometime. And so then I have to come and speak to you, and I already stumble around my words a lot, and so now it's even worse. So please bear with me uh, as I try and stumble through this talk. Um, but, you know, I have to admit that this year going to the writing cave uh, was actually a good thing. And the reason why I think that was a good thing is because something happened while I was in my writing cave, which is just the spare room at my parents' house, that made me change my whole talk. And I think that's a good thing because I like the direction it's going. It was a good thing for me, but not such a good thing for Sister Bethany, <laughs> poor Sister Bethany, because several weeks ago she asked me, what's your talk about, Father Mike? Because she wanted to coordinate the themes, and I told her a couple days ago, I said, Sister Bethany, um, I changed my talk. <laughs> she said, Father Michael, you are so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> You are so wonderful, Father Mike. No. She said, no, I think that's the Holy Spirit. And I said, I'm glad she said that. So anyway, so it's good for uh, me. I hope it's good for Sister Bethany. We could pray for her. But I want to tell you what happened when I was in the writing cave. Basically, the book I was working on is a, a total consecration to the Father, God the Father, through Jesus, based on the Gospel of John. So I basically spent the whole month immersed in the Gospel of John and its revelation of God the Father. And my heart is just full of the Father. And so I want to talk about our Father, God the Father. Now the theme for today is mission. So I want to speak about God the Father in the context of our mission in Jesus Christ. The Father in the context of our mission in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to start with what I think is one of the most powerful passages in all of sacred Scripture regarding the mission of Jesus Christ. It comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 18. And it says, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. I love that. 
Isn't that beautiful? Even if you don't know what it means, it's just beautiful. No one has ever seen God. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. It's beautiful even if you don't know what it means, but what does it mean? Well, here's what I think it maybe means. Nobody sees the Father but the Son. The Son sees the Father. And what does the Son see? What does the Son see when He sees the Father? A little over a year ago, I uh, had an experience after Mass or during Mass, during communion, where I felt like I got a little tiny glimpse, a little tiny, tiny glimpse of what the Son sees of the Father. And that experience came in the form of an insight into a word that we repeat Sunday after Sunday that I didn't usually think much about, but now it means so much to me. And it's the word that we say in the creed, begotten, as in begotten, not made. Now, we know that the Father eternally begets the Son, but here's some questions. Is the Father God? Come on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is the Son God? Are the Father and the Son equally God? Are they equal? Why? It would seem that they shouldn't be equal. Because when something comes from another, it's not equal. Like take other, I was writing this book. That comes from me. It's not equal to me. <laughs> it's less than me. When we make something, it's always less than us. Unless we procreate. That's why it's begotten, not made. Because the Father eternally begets the Son. He doesn't make the Son. And that makes all the difference. Because begetting, to beget something, it means it comes from another and yet is totally equal to that thing and the thing from which it comes. They're totally equal. So as the Father begets the Son... He gives himself completely to the Son without holding anything back, without holding anything back so that the Son is totally equal to the Father. Totally equal to the Father. If the Father, just hypothetically speaking, if the Father were to hold anything back as he begets the Son, like let's say he says to the Son, you know, Son, I love you. I'm going to give you omnipotence. I'm going to give you omniscience. But I'm going to keep omnipresence to myself. That's not a present I'm going to give to you, you know. well, then the Son wouldn't be equal to the Father. So it would be like this. If the Father decided, I want to be number one, I want to be the greatest, I'm going to hold something back as I eternally beget the Son because I want to be number one, then the Son wouldn't be equal to the Father. He'd say, I want to make you, not beget you. Now, that's just a hypothetical, and that's not what happened. Or rather, that's not what happens because the Father eternally begets the Son. But maybe that hypothetical gives us a little glimpse into the humility, the generosity, and the goodness of our Father, who when He gives Himself eternally in the, to the Son as He begets Him, holds nothing back so that the Son is equal to the Father. He wants the Son to be equal to the Father. That's the generosity of the Son. Now, maybe we get a little insight into that. But Jesus saw the whole thing. He sees the whole thing. He knows the generosity, the humility, the goodness of the Father. And Jesus himself, the eternal Son, knows that everything he has is from the Father. Everything he has from the Father. And what's Jesus' response? Father. He loves the Father. And I think the best response is the, the response that we see in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, one of my favorite movies. But my favorite scene is the resurrection scene. Remember the resurrection where, you know, it's like all the violence, then, ah, okay, the resurrection. But remember that scene. Jesus is resurrected by the Father, and he's sitting there. And he looks up at the Father, who has just raised him from the dead. He closes his eyes, and then he goes. He goes on his mission. The mission of the Son arises from the Son knowing what the Father gives to him, which is everything. And what is the mission of the Son? We already heard it. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who's in the bosom of the Father, the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father. He has made Him known, this Son who sees the Father in His goodness and His humility. 
His mission is he wants to make the Father known. The beauty of the Father, the humility of the Father, the goodness of the Father, the Son wants to make him known because no one has ever seen God. What does it mean that the Son makes the Father known? Well, there's another passage from the Gospel of John that helps us us to know. This is from John 5, verse 19 through 21. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself does. And greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. So that's the mission of the Son. He makes the Father known by doing what he sees the Father doing. What does the Son see the Father doing? He sees the Father giving of himself without holding anything back so that the Son is equal to the Father. And then what does the Son do? He does what he sees the Father doing. And so the Son gives himself to us without holding anything back so that we can be as equal to the Father and the Son in so far as is possible for a creature made in God's own image. That's Jesus' mission, that he gives himself to us, and that's the work that should make us marvel, that the Son gives himself so much to us without holding anything back that he wants to make us equal to the Father and the Son in so far as possible for a creature. That's the marvel. That's the marvel of the eternal life he gives us. That's the marvel of the salvation that Jesus gives us. And so that we can marvel, I want to read to you the greatest passage in all of sacred scripture. (laughs) At least I'm going to make an argument for it. You ready? The greatest passage in all of sacred scripture. This is at least my opinion. You ready? Of course, let's uh, do a process of elimination. Where would we find the greatest passage in all of scripture, Old Testament or New Testament? New Testament, because what's hidden in the old is fully revealed in the new. Now, in the New Testament is made up of many genres of books. We've got the the, the Acts of the Apostles, the Letters, Revelation, the Gospels. Where do you think the greatest passage would be? The Gospels, because as the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, the Gospels are the heart of Scripture. Now, there's four Gospels divided into two two types of Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the synoptics that follow the same storyline. And then you also have John which blazes its own trail. Where do you think the greatest passage would be? John, because as the saints say, that's the gospel that soars. But the gospel of John is divided into two main parts. (laughs) The book of signs and the book of glory. Where do you think the greatest passage would be? The book of glory, because signs point to the glory, and we're, we're looking for the most glorious, wonderful passage. But the book of glory is divided into three main parts. (laughs) You've got the farewell discourse. The passion and the resurrection, where do you think you'd find the greatest passage? Passion, resurrection, I say the farewell discourse. Ooh, Father, (laughs) so controversial. (laughs) Why? Because people save their best words for the end. And the farewell discourse is Jesus' farewell words, and what he expresses in the farewell discourse gets lived out in the passion and resurrection. But it's all there in the upper room when he does the farewell discourse, chapters 13 through 17. But the farewell discourse is divided into two main parts. (laughs) There's Jesus' farewell words to his apostles, chapters 13 through 16. But then there's Jesus' farewell words to the Father. Where do you think would be the greatest passage? The Father, chapter 17. This is my argument. So you guys all agree with me. (laughs) But I'm not looking for a whole chapter. I'm looking for a greatest passage. So where in chapter 17 would we find the greatest passage? I suggest to you that it's the very last verses that Jesus saved the best for last, just like at Cana. And in those last verses, he expresses the heart of his heart right before in the verses immediately following in 18 where he descends to the depths of his passion. And what does he say in John chapter 17, verses 24 through 26? He says, Father... I desire, because we're here getting to know the desire of the heart of Jesus as he gets to ready to go into his, his passion. Father, I desire 
that they also whom thou hast given me may be with me where I am. The divine name. He doesn't want us just with him in his humanity. He wants us with him in his divinity. Why? Because of what comes later. The next verse. I made no, Father, I desire that they also whom thou hast given me may be with me where I am to behold my glory which thou hast given me and thy love for me before the foundation of the world. That's so beautiful. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me and thy love for me before the foundation of the world. The reason why that's so beautiful for me is there's an intimacy and a love between spouses from which the children come and which the children should never see. There's an intimacy in the Trinity that it would seem we should never see and from which we come. But what Jesus is saying here is, I want them to see it. I want them to be in it. Father, I desire that they also whom thou hast given me may be with me where I am to behold my glory which thou hast given me and thy love for me before the foundation of the world. What's that glory? That the Father gave to the Son before the foundation of the world? It's how the Father begets the Son. How the Father gives himself without holding anything back so that the Son is equal to the Father. And what Jesus is saying here is I want to give myself, Father, without holding anything back so that those who you gave to me, which is all of us, may be with me where I am and that they would behold my glory, that they would be in this. In other words, that we would be divinized, that we would be made into God. What? God? God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Does this mean we get a planet? No. (laughs) Does it mean we become the Father? No. Does it mean we become the Holy Spirit? No. Does it mean we become the Son? Yes. With our baptism, we were transformed into the body of Christ. This is why we have a sacrament at, our, at the center of our worship, the Eucharist, where a creature bread is transformed in the body of Christ to, be fed, to feed a creature that has been transformed into the body of Christ, which is us, because we truly are the body of Christ And why is that important? Because of the last verses. Righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these know that thou hast sent me. There's his mission to make the Father known. What does he make known? I have made known to them thy name. What's the name that Jesus makes known to us? I am, right? Father. I have made known to them thy name, and I will make it known. Why? So that the love with which thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Everything hinges on the Father. When we know the name of the Father, when we know that God is our Father and we are his children and that the Father always says to us, you are my beloved, when we know that, when we rejoice in that, There we enter into God's glory and we realize what the Son has done for us. And then Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. That as the Father loved the Son by giving of himself without holding anything back, that the Son would be equal to the Father and that the Son gives himself to us without holding anything back so that we would be as equal to the Father and the Son as nowhere as possible. Jesus wants us to now give ourselves without holding anything back so that others can share with us in this beautiful communion of love that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, I forgot about the Holy Spirit, right? I made known to them thy name, Father, and I will make it known that the love with which thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. I guess we forgot the Holy Spirit. No, that the love with which thou hast loved me, love, that's the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants us in that communion of love. So i got to bring this to a close now. But I want to just say, our mission is to give ourselves without holding anything back so that we, the body of Christ, would make known the goodness, the humility, the beauty, the mercy of the Father. And I encourage you to get to know the Father more. Read the Gospel of John. But actually, don't just read it. Listen to it. When I was your age, (laughs) a long time ago, I listened to an audio presentation of the Gospel of John, masterful presentation, done by uh, Leonardo de Filippis. 
And for 20 years almost, I listened to that over and over again. Nothing has formed me theologically than listening to the Gospel of John over and over again. It is one of the greatest gifts I've ever discovered. And I want you to discover it too. So I talked to Leonardo last night. I said, hey, would you be willing to give the download for free to the college students at Seek? He said, yeah. So, <laughs> so if you want, here's my challenge to you. Get to know the Father by listening to the Gospel of John and especially the Farewell Discourse 13 through 17 and fall in love more deeply with the Father through His Word. Amen? Amen. So what's our mission? No one has ever seen God. The only Son who's in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. May we give ourselves without holding anything back so that the Father would be known and loved. Amen? Amen. The Lord be with you. Oh, shucks, I forgot to tell you. Uh, if you want to download, <laughs> uh, go to slsjohn.com. We made a website and it redirects. slsjohn.com. Very similar. Okay? The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks very much and God bless you. After graduating from the University of Central Florida, our next speaker joined the Sisters of Life at the age of 22. She fell in love with this community during her time at college, witnessing their work with pregnant women, women suffering from a previous abortion, as well as their work with students and retreats. She's an international speaker, and she currently serves as the vocations director of the Sisters of Life. Please help me welcome Sister Bethany Madonna. Brothers and sisters, you did not receive a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of love and peace and self-control. Good morning. <laughs> you cannot imagine my joy in being with you, uh, how grateful I am, how much I look forward to it, the joy that you give me. I thought I'd start this morning with a story. Uh, a sister and I flew into Farm Country, USA, Kansas, and uh, we were visiting this little Catholic school, and as we walked into the classroom belonging to the kindergartners, it took everything in me not to burst into tears uh, because of the purity, the goodness of those little faces. There was a little boy sitting in the back in a wheelchair, uh, with being tended to with so much care. There's a little girl in the front with Down syndrome playing with the others on the carpet. They said, gather children, gather, the sister's gonna share with us. And we spoke to them about how God made them, how much he loves them, how he has a beautiful plan for their life. And a little boy in the front launches his hand in the air and I, I couldn't even call on him fast enough, he was impelled. He goes, I know what it is. I was like, what's your name? He's like, Simeon. I was like, a prophet. <laughs> I go, Simeon, what is God's plan? He goes, well, we have to get more and more love inside our hearts and give it to other people so we can fight the devil. <laughs> now, Lord, let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled through this child. That is exactly the plan, my boy. Clearly a future missionary or exorcist so let's pray really briefly in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, may we receive more and more of the fire of your divine love into our hearts. May we give it to others. And may we fight against the enemy by the victory of your cross in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So three simple points. A spirit-filled evangelist receives, gives, and fights. First receive, the Holy Spirit is God, and within the Blessed Trinity, the love between the Father and the Son. He is so creative, so manifold. He's the comforter who consoles us. 
He's the advocate who defends us, the breath of life, the spirit of the Son, the promise of the Father, the fire of divine love. See, we have a convent in the Bronx and we have a friend named Frank. And he comes over every so often with donations and the man's a character and he's got this thick Bronx accent. Um, I'm gonna attempt it. And uh, the man's been totally overtaken by the Holy Spirit. So a conversation with Frank goes something like this. Frank, do you know divine mercy? Sisters, yeah, yeah, we love divine mercy. Frank, I'm on fire for divine mercy. Sisters, wow, I mean, uh, you know, stepping back a little bit. He continues, do you know the history? Um, we, we think so, yeah. Jesus said, if you pray the divine mercy chaplet at the moment at your death, he makes the devils flee, those little punks. We're like, whoa, whoa. He's like pounding the door frame with gusto. Then he's like, you know I teach CCD. We're like, no, we did not know that you teach CCD. <laughs> you know what I tell the kids? I point to the crucifix and I say, I don't like that guy. And the kids are like, what? I'm like, I love that man. A bird for divine mercy. Jesus said, I came to set the world on fire and how I wish it were already ablaze. In St. Paul's letter to the Romans, we read, the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ Jesus was conceived in the womb of his mother Mary. He performed miracles, he was raised from the dead. That same Holy Spirit formed you in your mother's womb. Just wanna take a moment to go back. I want you to close your eyes. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to take us back to the moment that you were conceived. Come Holy Spirit, regardless of the circumstances, that moment when God said, not another day without you. I choose you. I want you to be existence, warmth, total acceptance of you. You were not an accident. Nothing about you is a mistake. You are always wanted. I want you to be alone with God the Father in that place of belonging, his choice of you. You can always go there and you can live there. The same Holy Spirit forms a unique holiness in you. We are often, too often, fixated upon and preoccupied with our own concept of holiness and what it would look like on me. We don't determine that. This has everything to do with self-reliance, thinking that the burden is on me and actually preferring to do things according to my own tastes. Now, God loves you so much that he has a plan for your sanctity and it's tailored to you. It's perfect. To each of us is given a particular manifestation of the spirit. Nothing is withheld from us. He gives us his very breath. I remember my confirmation in eighth grade, really my only concern was that another girl was wearing the same dress as me. I mean, I was like, what? Come on. Why does stuff like this always have to happen to me? And now I don't worry when someone else is wearing the same thing as me. <laughs> That's growth, okay? So meanwhile, what happens in that sacrament? In confirmation, we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, his seven gifts, wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord. They're yours. I can say with Jesus, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. A spirit-filled evangelist first receives and then gives the second point to give. In confirmation, God has spoken who you are. 
his beloved son or daughter. And you're sent to proclaim the kingdom of God, which St. Paul reminds us is not about eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We have a culture that says, treat yourself, you know? This leaves us terribly dissatisfied. Uh, searching, asking, ah, what do I need? What do I need? Maybe I need a latte, a vacation. Maybe I need to go skydiving. I mean, seriously, it's never going to be enough. Only one thing is necessary. Do you hunger and thirst for the Holy Spirit? You see, you know a tree by its fruits, and self-seeking rots our hearts. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I want to share with you about my roommate from college, Michelle. She was a little wild. Uh, she'd had a pretty massive conversion coming into college from the party scene, modeling, um, training for Olympic soccer. She got knocked out with a serious illness and those idols came crashing down. Jesus had an invitation for her in that suffering and it was intimacy. Her sickness of body became health for her soul. She'd become successful through self-reliance and in her weakness, she experienced his strength, a strength she had not known before. She began a journey of freedom that comes from living completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. And when we first started hanging out, I really couldn't believe how we were spending our time. She'd dress up like Cinderella for terminally ill children. Uh, then next we'd be like giving out food to the homeless downtown and then daily mass helping the elderly. Then she kind of crossed the line. She was like, hey, on Saturdays I pray at the abortion clinic. You want to come with me? I was like, are you crazy? What, do you want to get us arrested or something? It's like, ruin my future? I had this image of like signs, yelling, German shepherds, me like on the ground in cuffs. I don't know. It was like, <laughs> she was like, it's the rosary. I was like, oh, the rosary. Yeah, I can do that. And I will never forget that first morning as long as I live. Tears streamed down my face as the sun rose over that dilapidated building, revealing a whole line of girls. They were my classmates. Abandoned, sad, numb. And I just knew that I would live and die for them. Michelle's witness opened a door for me to surrender to the sweetness of divine intimacy. And like the wind that blows where it wills, the Holy Spirit radically altered my perfectly laid plans. And he still does it every day. I'm grateful. We can be afraid to respond to the Holy Spirit's promptings. Maybe we don't think we have it what it takes. Maybe we're fearful of rejection. Maybe we think we'll be depleted. But generosity and obedience actually expands our hearts. It increases our joy. Obedience is a word that needs to be restored to its original splendor. It means to hear, it means to listen. I obey God because he is calling my name. A few examples of this. Adriana came to us early in her pregnancy, and growing up a Christian, she'd heard that God talks to people, and she thought, that doesn't happen to me. She'd gone to an abortion clinic twice, but felt conflicted, ended up leaving, and the third time on her way into the clinic, she saw people standing outside offering other options. Now, she'd convinced herself it was no big deal, but their presence contradicted that. Later, she was lying on the table being prepped. She heard from the depths of her heart a voice that said, Get up. She immediately got off the operating table. She walked out and she chose life. She said, ever since I've been listening to that voice, my life has changed. Another example, our sisters were traveling to the beatification of Blessed Solanus Casey. They stopped into a church and a sister saw a young woman sitting in the pew and heard, go say hi to her. To which she internally responded, oh, I don't know her. She's praying. Yeah, that would be weird. <laughs> Again, go say hi to her. I really don't know what I would say after hi. So, you know, if this is of the Holy Spirit, she would come over to me. <laughs> Finally, she sits down, 
looks her in the eye and goes, hi. And the girl goes, hi. Breaks into tears. She said, sister, I, I don't know what to do. I feel so unseen by my family. Sister said, you came to the perfect place, the church. I knew God wanted me to talk to you because he sees you. Another example, one of the women we serve through our Hope and Healing mission. For those suffering after abortion, she tells her testimony publicly, I'll call her Lauren. 3 a.m., flipping through the channels, she felt herself in the depths of despair. She landed on a local station and heard a woman sharing about her abortion experience, and she was sitting by a nun. At the bottom, it said, hope and healing after abortion in a number. As she jotted it down, a voice of accusation said, you are not worthy. And a whisper came over that and said, call them, go. Healing has started. On that day, she encountered Jesus' tender mercy. And at the end of it, she hails a cab. And the driver, uh, a woman covered with piercings and tattoos, kind of smirks at her and goes, boy, you don't look like the kind of woman who would be hanging out with nuns. It's like, I don't know what you say to that exactly, but. <laughs> she had an option of how to respond. And she said, they're helping me heal from my abortion. And the cab driver looks into the rearview mirror and locks eyes with her and goes, I've had three. Lauren goes, there's help for you. Jesus doesn't condemn, he heals. Years later, we had the opportunity to speak at her parish in Harlem and she joined us, got up at the end of every mass and testified to the new life she'd received in Jesus. Let's break the bondage of silence, she said. Embrace forgiveness because hope and healing has come to Harlem. A spirit-filled evangelist receives, gives, and fights. Light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. We have a friend, Joe, he's a daily communicant and fittingly he does carpentry projects at our mother house. Uh, he shared that his young wife, who was a nurse coming home from her shift on New Year's Eve, uh, was killed by a drunk driver. She was expecting their first child. In his grief, Joe begged for a sign from God that she was okay. One morning, months after the burial, Joe went to visit her gravesite and he lit a candle there. Later that night, after it had snowed all day, he felt drawn to go back to the cemetery. As he approached, his eyes welled up with tears as he saw the warm flickering of the candle, still lit and burning. He cried his heart out in gratitude and said, my wife brought me back to my faith. In the midst of any darkness, tragedy, sin, disappointments, betrayals. There lies the temptation to doubt God's goodness, his presence, his love, his mercy. Faith can be shaken, hope can be lost, and love can grow cold. You know, you can measure what matters to God, what's most precious to him, by what's attacked by the enemy. Brothers and sisters, we know that the victory has been won even if the battle for souls still wages. See, Jesus told us how to enter that kingdom, but he loved us enough to tell us what prevents us from entering eternally. We want heaven and we wanna bring as many with us as possible. Now is the time to defend the inheritance we've received, to invite others to become heirs too. Now is the time to usher in a new Pentecost staying close to Mary and opening ourselves up to be clothed with power, power from on high, to stir into flame the gift that we've received, saying always and everywhere, come Holy Spirit. See, Pentecost changed everything. The very men who denied Jesus were hiding in an upper room, paralyzed in fear. They received the Holy Spirit and began boldly proclaiming the Lord Jesus, healing, preaching and teaching in his name. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. A priest friend of the community shared about a dream he had. He was, he was walking through some dark woods at night and he was holding a lit candle. Suddenly the winds picked up around him and the candle started to flicker. He went to guard it and shield it. 
A voice calmly said, blow out your candle. Somehow he had an awareness that he cannot listen to that voice. He keeps walking and it really begins to storm, the wind, the rain. He's guarding and shielding his flame. The wax is like melting onto his hands, burning him. The voice again, this time raised, blow out your candle. Blow out your candle. He perseveres and suddenly he comes to a clearing in the woods. Standing in the middle, he turns around and one by one, men and women come out of the woods with their extinguished candles coming to him to be lit again. As we leave this conference, brothers and sisters, take courage. Take courage. May you keep your flame burning brightly, shining before all. Let's close right now by inviting the Holy Spirit into our hearts. You can extend your hands. Open them before him. Open your hearts. And I hope you'll join me in a song. Let's just sing this twice through a cappella. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Again. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, He's always with you. Thank you. Just over 20 years ago, God communicated a mission to this final speaker, and it continues to change the world. Working alongside the Holy Spirit and some of his closest friends, he founded Focus on one campus with just a handful of missionaries. His purpose was and is to become who God created him to be and to help others do the same. It's with great honor and joy that I introduce to you the founder, CEO of Focus, Curtis Martin. Thank you, Steve. Great to be with you. Todd, thank you so much. Brought out a special guest. I've got St. Therese of Lisieux right here with me, a relic of hers. She is the, uh, she's the patron of missions for the Catholic Church, which is an amazing story because she died in her early 20s and lived her life in a cloister. So she never went on mission trips in the flesh, but she did because she united everything she did, all of her prayer, all of her work, to the missions, Lord God, that everything I could do would bring glory to you and souls into your kingdom. Here's the reality. This generation of Catholics is responsible for this generation of people. Right now, one more time, this generation of Catholics is responsible for this generation of people. Right now, there are countless multitudes of people who are living in unbelievable poverty. They do not, they're, right now they're, they're starving, they're hungry, they haven't eaten in days right now. Or maybe it's clean water that they lack, or adequate medicine, or shelter. One of the great troubles for the poor, the chronically poor, is safety. There are more people living in slavery today than ever in the history of the world, and they're waiting for you and me to come alive in Jesus Christ 
and rescue them. And these forms of poverty are devastating, whether it's, it's traditional slavery with work or the sex trade, people are living in misery, waiting for us to come alive in Christ and go get them. And here's the deal, as Catholics, we don't believe in reincarnation. So they've got, we've got one life to get them. Right now, this sense of urgency, I work with college students, I work with you all, you all work with college students, you're leaders. And what I, what I hear frequently on the college campus is, hey, look, I'm not hurting anybody. Are you kidding me? The world's dying, and you're supposed to be on the rescue team, and you're playing video games. You're killing people, literally. And so my appeal to you today is to come on mission, to come on mission, to recognize that the gift of Christ is the free, that our salvation is a gift. You can't earn it, it's impossible. God gives it to us freely. So the, the gift of initial justification, of stepping into a relationship, absolutely a free gift. But here's the deal. Salvation and justification, a free gift, but discipleship costs everything to follow him. We've talked earlier in the week about the importance of giving our lives to Christ, about how Christ is not an option. He needs to be the center, and we're going to build on that. We talked this morning already about the importance of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and I want to talk about the mission, the method modeled by the Master, and appeal to you to spend the rest of your lives living costly discipleship. I had an interesting experience a couple months ago. I was at a, a meeting, and there was a gentleman giving a presentation. His name is Christian Smith. He works at Notre Dame, and uh, he's a great socioco Notre Dame. And, uh, and Christian knows young people, and he knows kind of the reality that we're living in our culture. And, and I'd never met him before. I'd gone to talks, I'd read articles. I happened to be seated right next to him, and after he finished his presentation, I said, Christian, just want to introduce myself. I'm Curtis Martin. He goes, oh my goodness, you're the guy from Focus. I said, yes. He goes, I love Focus. I said, well, I love your work. Let's have a mutual admiration society. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> and, and, but he said, Curtis, you're going to love my next book. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, I have a team of hundreds of researchers, and we, we interviewed literally thousands of families, and we found one set of families who raised children, and all of them left the church. And then out of all the people we interviewed, we found another set who raised children, and all of them stayed in the church, and we asked them hundreds of questions. I said, wow, that's, I would love to know what the questions, what the answers are. He goes, no, it's better than that. One, one thing came to the top. One thing had the biggest impact. There were many things that had impact, that you would pray together, that you'd have meals together. All that stuff was important. He said, but the one thing, the one thing that was most important was the families who had regular spiritual conversations with their children raised lifelong practicing Catholics. And so I, I want to make two invitations to you. I want to invite you into the habit of spiritual conversations. I would argue that that's what Focus has been trying to do for over 20 years, right? That's what a small group Bible study is. Let's read the scriptures and talk about it. And the scriptures are the best, but it could be the lives of the saints. It could be salvation history in the Old Testament. There's the, the, the Bible and, and the history of the church are filled with stories. And I'm not talking about talking about the problems in the church. I'm talking about having a conversation about why Jesus Christ is the most compelling character in all of human history. And the most compelling characters are those who join their life to his, like our friend St. Therese, who lived a very, very simple life from the world standpoint, but from the faith standpoint, we all know, anybody who's had a devotion to St. Therese knows this is one powerful friend. And she lived an extraordinary life, and her, her autobiography is amazing and inspiring. And here's the secret. You are co-authoring your autobiography every day. You get to choose what the next chapter says. And I want to talk to you about that. In fact, what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through what a spiritual conversation might look like. I'm going to use the, the Gospel of John, because that's what Father Gately told me I had to do. No, I'm kidding. The, uh, 
what I want to do, I want to read, and just this is an example. Obviously, with thousands of you, we really can't have a great conversation, so it's going to be a little one-sided, but to model it, to, to look at it. And I think what we'll find is we open the Scriptures, particularly what I like to say, the, the Torah of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and then repeat. Read those five, four or five times, slowly, prayerfully. Then go everywhere you want, but oh my goodness, you're going to encounter Christ most immediately in the four Gospels and in the book of Acts. So you want to know the context. This is John chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 22. I'm just going to read a short passage. It won't take more than 60 seconds, maybe maybe 75. But what I want to do is I'd like to look at it because I think what we'll find is there's stuff in here that should make us step back and say, oh my goodness, I've never seen this before. We tend to read the Bible with a sense of piety. Oh yes, amen, this is great. Do you understand what you're reading? Not at all. Okay, but and, and no, the, there's, there's things in here to wrestle with. So here's the deal. In John chapter 14, excuse me, Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to do Matthew, not John. I lied. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 14, we, uh, we're going to encounter Jesus right after he fed the 5,000. This is immediately after. And this is the passage. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was all alone. All right, I want to stop for just a second. This, so here's the deal. Jesus just fed 5,000. We know from the text that actually that's 5,000 men. So, and this was a religious gathering, so you know there was at least twice as many women, right? And, uh, and probably lots of children. No contraception back then, so lots and lots of kids. And so you, you got, I don't know, 25, 30,000 people. And, and Jesus feeds them miraculously. As soon as they're done eating, they collect the 12 baskets. He tells the apostles, you guys get in the boat, go to the other side. I will dismiss the crowds. Jesus is the most amazing person in all of history. He, is, he can do anything he wants, but I would argue in this particular instance, he's the least qualified person on earth to dismiss the crowds. Have you seen Father Gately? Sister Bethany, Archbishop Shapu walking through the crowds out here, they can't get from one place to the other because everyone wants to talk to them. Oh, it's so great to be, can we, I want to take a selfie, all that stuff, right? Jesus isn't Archbishop Shapu or Sister Bethany. He didn't give a good talk. I'm sure he gave a good talk. He raised their children from the dead. He healed them from leprosy. This is the most amazing person on earth and no one's going to want to leave. And what does he do? He gets his best attendants to help him to leave, get them to leave, and he says, immediately, go in the boat, I got this. It's interesting, if you read back up a little bit further, we know what meal he served them miraculously. It says, and it was evening, and the disciples came to him and said, this is a lonely place, we should send them away. And Jesus said, give them something yourselves. So it was evening, it was dinner time. And so how bad was Jesus at dismissing the crowd? Well, this is it. Go, they wanted him to go before him to the other side. So he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And it was evening. It took him all day to get rid of the crowds. The disciples are in the boat for 24 hours. And we're going to find out in just a second they're in the middle of a horrendous storm. It is not going well for them. And he's in, Jesus is in no hurry. He dismisses the crowd, which took him almost 24 hours. Then, as if he's still not in a rush, he goes, yeah, now that I finally got those folks to go, I just want some time with my father. So he goes up into the mountains and prays, and then we're told he comes back and he waits. He, by the time he comes to them walking in the fourth watch, which was between three o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning, they have been in the boat for almost 36 hours in the middle of a storm. Now, four of them are professional fishermen. They know how to handle a boat. This was bad. And this is what I want to have a spiritual conversation about. Have you ever done, at least you thought you did, exactly what God asked, told you to do? Get in the boat and go. And then it went really, really badly. Because it will. It's going to go really badly sometimes. It went badly for Jesus sometimes. But they did exactly what they were told to do. And, and it was horrible. And when he shows up, he makes it worse because when he shows up in the middle of the night, he's walking on the water and they think it's a ghost. So he terrifies them. And then he says, be at peace. And the storm goes away. And I, I, why did Jesus want them to get in the boat 
And I don't think it was to get to the other side. I think he knew there was going to be a storm. When he's God, he made the storm. I think he wanted them to do something that he couldn't teach them with words. I think he wanted them to trust him. He wants you to trust him. And he could have sat on the side of the lake and said, look, I would really like you to trust me. I mean, I'm, I am, I'm really trustworthy. Would you please trust me? No, I'm, ta- I'm crazy trustworthy. You know, you really, I'm so trustworthy. Please trust me. And nothing would have happened. They actually had to experience horror and terror and rescue because he was not done with them. They were going to watch him suffer and die and then rise from the dead. And c- discipleship is wildly expensive. And the question is, will we accept the free gift of God and then return the favor? As we were told earlier, Jesus saves us by imitating his Father. The Father gives all that he has, holds nothing back, and begets the Son. And Jesus comes to us and he gives all that he has. He holds nothing back because he's a perfect a person, a follower of his Father. He's living this amazing reality. I want to imitate my Father who gives everything. I will give everything. We don't have everything. We're not infinite, but you can, can give, and I can give everything we have. It's a finite gift, but it can be a complete gift, as it was for St. Therese, to recognize it. So that's my invitation. First, spiritual conversations. Let's read the scriptures and the lives of the saints, and let's learn those stories, and let's talk about them. And have you ever been in a place where things are going really, really badly? I can tell you, I had a conversation about that backstage 12 minutes ago, because it's the reality of disciples. And we shouldn't be surprised. He says, oh, would you like to be my disciple? Great. What I want you to do is I want you to deny yourself every day, pick up your cross, and follow me. I'm not pulling any punches. It's going to cost all you have. But just for a while, just let me tell you another story. There was a young guy, like you, living from a place of conversion. He's at the University of Paris uh, a couple hundred years ago, and he's on fire. And he's trying to get his friends, like many of you, and, and a couple of them are coming along, one of the roommates, not on board. Months pass, multiple months, a year passes. This guy's just a hard egg. He's not, he's really tough. So what are you gonna do? This young student keeps after him. Finally, after over a year, this friend decides to give his life to Christ as well. They go on, St. Ignatius and St. Francis Xavier, to found the Jesuits. They were best friends. Go Jesuits. They were best friends. And, and, and they wanted to serve Christ together for the rest of their lives. And, and, and Ignatius was in charge, and he, he, was, he was all about it. And he got a couple of Jesuits, and he was like, you guys are going to go to Asia. And they were like, that's great. And, and Francis and I will stay here in Rome, and we'll, we'll, we'll run this. And they said, that's great. And then those guys got sick, first one, then another. And they're like, where are the other Jesuits? And he found a couple more Jesuits. It's like, you guys go. And finally, they got sick. And finally, he looked at his best friend, the one he wanted to be on mission with for the rest of his life. And Xavier was the only one left. Back in those days, you get on a ship and go to Asia. You may not ever come back. Xavier never came back. And at the port, they said goodbye to their dreams of serving Christ shoulder to shoulder temporarily. And Xavier went. He baptized hundreds of thousands of people brought Christ to entire new countries. Ignatius led, led the Jesuits, and the Jesuits sent missionaries to, to Northern Europe, to North and South America. Literally, this band of brothers went all over the world, letting Christ be known and calling people to two levels of conversion. The first one is, will you accept the free gift of Jesus Christ that you would be saved? Would you accept that? Because here's the deal, the greatest form of poverty isn't food or clothing or safety, it is that you don't know, and there are many people don't know, that there's a father just like the father in the prodigal son who just simply loves us and is waiting for us to turn to him. I mean, if we would turn to him, he would run to us and embrace us. Not knowing that is the greatest poverty. You can give somebody some food, they'll be hungry again tomorrow. You give somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ, they'll live forever. And Ignatius and Xavier, best friends, were separated on this earth and spent the rest of their lives on mission together, but not in the same place, which is my call, my invitation to you. Would you be willing to walk with me? No, to run with me. And Sister Bethany and Father Michael, many of you already out 
there are already running. Would you like to run with us? Not just to accept the mercy of Christ, but the second conversion is this. In the first conversion, we accept the free gift of God. For me, it was reading Luke chapter 6, verse 46, and Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? And when I read that, I was like, oh my goodness, is, is it like he said that right to me, Curtis? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? I, if you asked me, I would, yeah, I probably is Lord. And if you watched me, you would never have guessed because my life was not at all aligned. And I just, I fell to my knees and said, I'm sorry. And like the prodigal son, I just, just want to come home. And that, that led to the first conversion, kind of, hey, I'd be willing to do anything. In fact, I was on my knees in my dorm room. I remember, the, not the exact words, but the sentiment, Lord, I want to come home. I'm a sinner. I've wrecked everything. If you would let me come home, I will go anywhere you want. I'll do anything you want. I'll say anything you want. I'm all in. In other words, I was willing to make sacrifices to now make Jesus the Lord. And that's the first one. Are you willing to make sacrifices so that Jesus could be your Lord? But the invitation to missions one step further. Are you willing together to make sacrifices so that other people could come to know Jesus, because that's the mission of Jesus. Yes, he's the Messiah and we want his salvation, but his salvation is an invitation to come on mission with him. And here's the deal, we're not gonna be together any more than Ignatius and Xavier were. We're gonna be scattered all over the place, but in clusters of friends where you are. Because here's the deal, the separation is temporary. Just a couple decades, a few decades. Ignatius and Xavier, They've been sharing life together for the last 400 years, uninterrupted in the presence of the Blessed Trinity. This life is so short, nothing else matters. If you were to gain all the wealth and all the fame and all the glory that this world offers, if you were to die without God, you would be a cosmic failure. And if you never had all of those things, but you were to gain Christ and bring others with you, you would become the greatest of blessed souls. As Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, then all these things can be added on. But we've got to get this one right first. And St. John Paul said this, the number of people who do not know Jesus has actually doubled in size since the time of the Second Vatican Council. The world is dying, and they're waiting for you to come alive and go on mission. I want to invite you to appeal to you to come on with me. I need you. We need each other. We all need Christ. Can we go on mission together? Let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, we thank you that you sent your Son on a mission to give himself completely for our salvation. And that when he did so, he was imitating you, Father, who gave everything he had. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Lord, you, you gave everything to your Son, holding nothing back, and he gave everything. Give us the greatness of heart to be able to embrace your mission and give everything to you for your glory and for the salvation of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you and God bless.